first because it gets it out of the way. It means I can have more conversations about things because they kind of know where I'm coming from. Um, I was going to go out for friends Friday night, so it means that I have to worry about <laughs> getting rubbish on Saturday. And everyone's very forgiving because, um, you know, I have them a proper chance to prepare. Um, so hopefully, well, hopefully I'm very forgiving. Um, also, the thing is that I haven't been to one of these conferences before. So I don't know the culture here. So forgive me if this is not quite what you expect. Hopefully it will be of some interest. Um, so that's a disadvantage of going first, so I didn't get a chance to kind of see how it is. The other reason I'm quite pleased is because I noticed there's a kind of gender split with all the girls on um, Saturday and all the boys on Thursday and Friday, and this kind of blows that out of the water, so that's really good. Um, okay, so I'm going to talk about mathematical popular cultures. So, where should we start? Oh yeah, and thank you for inviting me. <laughs> uh, it's very nice to be here. So I'm going to talk about storytelling. Um, for me, mathematics comes in, and everything else comes into being through the stories that we tell about it and about the people who do it and the people who don't do it, about what it is and what it isn't. So I'll start with my favourite quotation about stories, which is from the um, author Jeanette Winterson. It's a way of explaining the universe while leaving the universe unexplained. It's a way of keeping it alive, not boxing it into time. Everyone who tells a story tells it differently. Just to remind us that everybody sees it differently. Some people say there are true things to be found. Some people say there are things to be proved. I don't believe them. The only thing for certain is how complicated it all is, like string full of knots. It's all there, but hard to find the beginning, and impossible to fathom the end. The best you can do is admire the cat's cradle, and maybe not it up a bit more. So when I say that I'm interested in stories, I don't mean that things are just stories. Stories are incredibly powerful, um, they, they're how we make sense of the world. And uh, this is kind of what my aim is now, is to try and take, to use Jeanette Winston's metaphor, to try to find a part of this string full of knots, to try to see what's going on there, to try and look at strands, and maybe knot it up a bit more and perhaps a better way, whatever that might mean. Um, so there's lots of places you can look for stories about maths. You can look in institutions like this one, you can look in classrooms, you can look in um, lecture halls, you can look all over the place. I'm going to look on in popular culture. There are various reasons for this. One is because I like to watch TV and call it work. Um, the other is because I think the media is incredibly influential. It does provide us with the storylines through which we think ourselves and think other people. And the other is there's kind of been a proliferation. I started doing this stuff a while ago, thinking around 2003, I started to get interested in mass and popular culture. Um, but there's really been an explosion since then of stuff. I've got just a couple of examples on, on here. This is Dara O'Brien's School of Past Songs. Do people know it? Yeah. yeah. Um, a very blokey show on, on um, Dave. You can tell it's a blokey show because it's on a channel called Dave, can't you? I won't say much about this, but it's, um, it's got Marcus de Sorto in it and uh, Dara O'Brien, and they kind of solve problems. Um, and then this is the Big Bang Theory, do people know that one? Yeah, I might say a bit more about that if we have time. Um, you can probably tell them that it's about um, a group of geeks and then their neighbour. You can probably tell which one is not the geek from that photo, even if you've never seen the show before. Um, so they're very contrasting shows. One's a kind of fictional sitcom, one's a, also a comedy, but it's factual and problem solving based. There's also a whole range of other sources, and I'll, I'll look at some of them in this talk. And I'm going to start with a question. Do we all use mathematics every day? And we go back about a year, when you might remember um, the great Daniel Day-Lewis winning the Oscar for Best Actor for his performance as Abraham Lincoln. Have people seen Lincoln? Uh, do people remember the mathsy bit, people who saw it? Okay, one person does. <laughs> um, there's a great bit where he's... Um, He's, he remembers back to Euclid. You know it's about the abolition of slavery. That's a bit of American history it tracks. And um, in this film, Lewis, as um, Lincoln says, Euclid's first common notion is this. Things which are equal to the same thing are equal to each other. That's the rule of mathematical reasoning. It's true because it works, has done and always will do. In this book, um, Euclid's Elements, Euclid says this is self-evident. You see, there is... There it is, even a 2,000-year-old book, a mechanical law. 
It is self-evident truth that things which are equal to the same thing are equal to each other. So what he's doing here is he's using um, Euclid and mathematics as a kind of argument for race equality. The, the self-evidence of race equality. I think that's kind of interesting because I don't think we often think about the relationship between mathematics and um, empathy and justice, and which is what's going on here. I think it kind of comes up quite a lot in popular culture. And I'm not going to show you a clip if it works. I really hope it does because it's going to be such a dull talk if it doesn't. This is from Mean Girls, which is like one of my favourite examples of massive popular culture. Brilliant film. Um, yeah, which. Um, stars Lindsay Lohan, thank you, before she um, had her fourth in race, um, as um, Katie Perry, who is very good at maths. And the bit I'm going to show you comes from right near the end. How many people see the Mean Girls? I'm quite interested. Oh, actually, that's not a bad take on the Mean Girls. Um, so, some of you will know the story. So, she's um, in high school, and here she is in a mathletes competition, and she's in the sudden death round of the final of the mathletes. So, it's very exciting. I might need to adjust the sound because I haven't tested the sound yet, but we'll see how it goes. I can't install Flash apparently, so I think it's playing anyway. Contestants? Fine. How's the sound? I a bit more. Okay. Is that anyone I can turn these up a bit? The limit of this equation. It's also saying it has a sound thing here. That's it. Oh, that's better. That will that will do it. Won't it? Okay. It's going to ask me every time. The moment's decision. Contestants, find the limit of this equation. Calling somebody else fat won't make you any skinnier. Calling someone stupid doesn't make you any smarter. And ruining Regina George's life definitely didn't make me any happier. All you can do in life is try to solve the problem in front of you. The limit is negative one. Oh crap, I lost. That answer is incorrect. And we are in a sudden death. If Miss Heron can answer this problem correctly, we have a winner. Limits, why couldn't I remember anything about limits? Limits, that was a weak Aaron guy's haircut. Oh god, he looks so cute. Okay, focus, Katie. What was on the board behind Aaron's head? The limit never approaches anything. The limit does not exist. The limit does not exist! Our new state champions, the North Shore Mathletes. Isn't that nice? Unfortunately, this is not nice. I love big girls. Don't The terminology is how to say bastardized. There is no limit of an equation. Okay. Let's not worry about that. 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 Maths is a story we can tell about it. Let's look at it as a story. Let's not worry about whether it's true or not. This is a typical post-structural sidestep. Forget about truth. I want to set that up. So that's, we're going to have a, a, a kind of um, amnesty on truth for, for an hour. Um, so what happens in Mean Girls is that um, she has that revelation during when she's faced with this limits question. She has the, you know, she's, um, she realizes that calling someone else fat you know, it's not a good idea. You know, it's ruining someone's life. It's not a good idea. She goes through this monologue in her head. Um, so, in some senses, that kind of process of thinking about the mathematics and the process of kind of empathising and social understanding <coughs> paralleled in that scene. And she gets the question right, and she sorts her life out afterwards. And I think that's a really kind of interesting example. And I think what you get there is this idea that maths is linked to the everyday. It's just something we do as part of the mathematical ideas, mathematical ways of being are things that are kind of integrated. And you get that in other things as well. You get that, um, for example, in Sudoku puzzles. Well, I don't know, I'm not quite sure. I've played 2048 at the moment slightly addictively on my phone. Um, I, I'd really recommend it. It's really good fun for passing 15 minutes. I'm not sure whether it's maths or not, but it kind of feels quite mathematical. And these are things which lots of people engage with. There are other examples that come up. I mean, Tetris is a classic example. Another game. Also, TV shows like Countdown, which can mass as part of the everyday. Um, films, like, like I said, but also a range of other films. Um, 
So, if we've got maths so much embedded in the everyday in popular culture, how come we've still got this idea that people have that maths isn't something they do most of the time? Um, this is kind of captured by what Olive Scott's most calls the paradox of relevance, which is that if you ask kids in school, you know, is maths useful? They'll say, yeah, it's really, really useful. Then you'll say, how's it useful? And they'll say, oh, for doing your shopping. I don't ever use maths when I'm doing my shopping, or hardly ever. Um, you know, if I have to, if I have those vouchers for 30, you know, £4.50 off, if you spend 30 quid or more, I add up the total on my um, phone. I don't actually use mathematical skills. I don't think most people do. So it's interesting that people can't pin down where the mathematics is, even though they think it's really useful. This is a kind of paradox. And my feeling is that this paradox arises from the fact that even though we reiterate this idea that in the everyday, we actually, alongside that, construct it as foreign elite. Um, you see it sometimes when one newspaper says about Stokers, don't worry, it's not maths. You know, the idea of kind of keeping away from maths. So I'm going to look at that, I'm going to look at it, oh, I forgot about the darts. Darts are my, one of my favourite examples of maths in everyday life. Uh, finishes. Absolutely fascinating um, application of maths, so I had to put it in there. Um, and again, something which people don't think of as mathematical. I mean, people don't know how to play darts. Um, it's worth looking at it if, you're, if you like puzzles about um, numbers, because finishing is brilliant. Because um, you have to finish on a double, so, so it creates lots of kind of patterns within the numbers. Um, so I want to look at this paradox <coughs> through numbers. Are people aware of numbers? Mm -hmm. A bit more awareness of numbers, okay. So this is a TV show <coughs> from the US. It ran for, I think it's 118 episodes, yeah. Over six seasons. So a quite a long running show. Um, it features two brothers, uh, Charlie and Don. One is a mathematician um, at a university, a professor of maths. The other is an FBI agent. So your typical American family. Um, you can probably tell from the image which one is the FBI agent and which one is the mathematician, even if you haven't seen it before. He's a mathematician. He's a <laughs> so, um, so Charlie, who's, who's the mathematician, and Don, the FBI agent, you probably could guess if you haven't seen it, they team up every week to solve crimes. Uh, they also have um, an FBI dad, as he calls himself, Alan Epps, who also gets in on the act sometimes. And um, Charlie has some colleagues, um, a physicist called Larry, and actually someone who starts with his doctoral student and then becomes his colleague and his girlfriend. Ethically hugely problematic, called Amita. Mita Ramanujan, who also sometimes gets involved in helping solve maths cases. Uh, before I talk a bit more about the show, I'm going to show you the opening credit sequence from season one. You might have noticed that US television shows don't have opening credit sequences very often anymore. Um, so the, the sequence did get dropped after two seasons. But I think it's still interesting, because it's incredibly di didactic. Um, We all use math every day. Forecast weather. To tell time. Pay the money. Pay the money. We also use math to analyze crime. Analyze crime. Reveal patterns. Predict behavior. Using numbers, we can solve the biggest mysteries we know. Math every day to predict the weather. I don't know about you, but I can never use maths to predict the weather. Um, and it can solve the greatest mysteries we know. Quite an amazing kind of push for maths in that critic thing. It's quite didactic as well. It's almost like a teacher. <coughs> you can imagine a teacher saying in the classroom. I think it's incredible that it's on the opening sequence to a show that ran for 118 episodes and generated a lot of fan support. Um, now, maths is used in the show quite a lot or at least reference in the show quite a lot, um, partly for solving crimes, and we'll come back to that, but also for other things, like um, in one of the later seasons, Charlie writes a book about the mathematics of friendships called The Attraction Equation, which becomes a bestseller. Um, and then also, um, they all team up and they try to sort out their university's basketball team by applying mathematics and physics, because their basketball team loses, apparently. They start winning when they use mathematics. So there's quite a lot of uses of maths. But most of the maths is the crime-solving stuff. 
Um, and Charlie seems to be able to pop over to the FBI headquarters pretty much any time he wants. He doesn't seem to actually have the meetings and things which litter my life as an academic. So that's quite convenient. And when they do the maths, they go into what I call math bits. So they're slightly different than the rest of the show. They're bits where they use analogies to try to explain a bit of maths which is going to work for this bit of the <coughs> crime solving. And there's usually maybe three of those per episode. I'm going to show you two of them. Um, and after that, I'd like you to have a little chat about what you reckon to them. So think about what's happening in these math bits. Think about comparisons between the first one, which is an early math bit, um, from around season one or two, and a later math bit from, I think, it's season five or something. Um, the first one does the Koenigsberg bridge problem, and the second one does the Turing test. They're both bits of maths which I kind of get. There aren't so many of those anymore. Um, so that's partly why I chose them. I also found them on YouTube. They're quite short, but I'll play one after the other. first example better because you could see there was some maths in it, the kind of bridge, but it was used as a sort of black box because yeah. you were just told something about yeah. and so it was like the math, there is some maths clever people can use to solve this, but we weren't you're not gonna know how it works. Yeah. Whereas the second one we were left in floating a little bit, we weren't quite clear. There was quite a nice analogy but Yeah. 
Yeah, no, I, I, I think it is a bit black boxy. It's a bit, here is this genius brain that can do this maths. Yeah, it's not about you engaging with the maths. That's definitely it. Yeah, anything else? Yeah. Well, we were discussing, uh, well, various things, but the, the Lindsay Lohan clip. And uh, I, I think what that presented is still mathematics as, as something that is remote from, from ordinary people. I mean, she, in my estimation, though I have a particular professional point of view, um, she was guessing. And she happened to guess the right answer for a set of circumstantial reasons that are made very clear. It's well done. But it shows us that Mathematics is beyond extraordinarily beautiful young actors. Right. Uh, and therefore, most of the rest of us as well. Okay, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. I'd say it's a bit different than numbers. I have a slight different reading. I think Lindsay Lohan in film, we're supposed to identify with her, and she's a bit like us. Um, whereas Charlie is definitely not like us. Charlie goes to Princeton at 13, publishes his first paper at 14, and he's definitely a genius for lots of others to So there's not a point of identification with Charlie in the same way. So, even though I, th I think also there's a build-up that Lindsay Lohan has, Katie Heron, we should call her I suppose, is very, very good at maths. And there's a sense in which she probably does know more than that clip suggests, as, an, as things have build up in the plot, I'd say, to suggest that she is doing something. Even though I agree the clip is a, it's a something of revelation. Yeah, it's I agree a with moment you. Of inspiration. In the film, her background is given. It's yeah, <laughs> so I think it... I think it is a little different, although it's an interesting point. I'll have to think about it a bit more, yeah. I was also going to say that in Mean Girls, when they ask her why does she like mathematics, she yeah. says, well, because it's the same all over. I've lived in Africa, I live in the States, yeah. and the math is the same everywhere you go. A contentious claim, but yes. certainly one that supports your reading that she, we're supposed to identify with her, that it's, it's, a, it's a distributed yeah. uh, pop property of all of us, that we could do this. Yeah, that's a good point. And also you've got um, the maths teacher is Tina Fey. There's a little point of identification for a lot of women. Um, and also quite ordinary and, and quite lovely. Yes, and very funny. Yeah. Yes. Uh, it would be interesting to, to, to discuss this concerning uh, myths that are used there and, and, and also misleading. Things. So like, I think there is a big discussion about genius or not genius. Uh, so I think that this is this is uh, very misleading that so a good mathematician is so uh, I mean, many good mathematicians are uh, saying that they are not geniuses they just work hard and it's very long and, and so on so that's that's one that uh, Hendrik mentioned that uh, who in practice will not cross the bridge twice if needed from this we, we, we get another problem that, that I think that uh, a very small percentage of mathematics is actually practice oriented uh, and the, the bulk of it is, uh, is, is just fun and, and game and there is also the, the issue of uh, creating solvable problems uh, to keep on the fun uh, of, of it so, so the, the, if, if it was consisting of only intractable problems then it wouldn't, it wouldn't work but strangely it works for some applications but in, in general you have to have the ability to create a problem that's, that will be solved, and this is artificial uh, mostly. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of stuff in there. I mean, the genius thing I'm going to come back to, as a post-structuralist, I don't use the term misleading, because it's, again, it's talking about truth, but I agree that that construction is really problematic, because repeatedly at the construction of the mathematician is genius, and I've got lots more examples to come. Um, in the next section of the talk, so we'll come back to that. The other thing is about this idea of the needing to convert the everyday into the mathematics, to render it mathematical. I think that comes across visually in the clips very much. If you notice, um, it's, it's hard to see from this, you don't get much of the normal stuff, you get a little bit before and after the math bits. But um, what you have is a very um, standard, kind of realistic genre. You know, like CSI or any of those other kind of law and order, those American TV crime shows. Standard kind of realistic conventions of storytelling, of visuals, sound and stuff. Um, and then you go to these weird math bits, don't you? Where suddenly you get these diagrams and everything moves around. And Charlie's voice goes in time with the diagrams. It's not a naturalistic speaking. Um, and that is all about the need to render the everyday mathematical, the need to have a brain that can do that. It's interesting that in the early math bit you may have noticed there's no person there, Charlie's not in it. That's because Charlie does all the math bits originally, and in some sense they're seen as outside of the human early on. Then when other people start doing them, like a meter steps in, you need to have a person in there. So you might have seen that meter's in the math bit, she holds the rose. 
Um, so that's an interesting kind of shift, but it's also, it doesn't really separate from the fact that you need someone to do that conversion for you. Some genius to render the, the mathematical, um, the everyday mathematical. And also, you may have noticed with the meter one that Charlie starts and ends it. In some sense, he authorizes it. He says, he leads into the, the, the Turing test, he leads out of the Turing test. I and mean, that really is about a meter's position, and we'll come back to gender issues um, in relation to that in a little bit. So, I'm now going to do, it's quite fun, because I'm in the Hardy room, or we're just in the Hardy room. I'm going to quote yeah. Hardy, so that's quite cool. Um, I'm going to quote it because I want to kind of keep going on those kind of themes about the elitism of maths. Um, so this is a classic bit of text, isn't it? A chair or a star is not least like what it seems to be. And while we think of it, the fuzzier its outlines become in the hazy sensation which surrounds it. But two, in inverted commas, or 317, has nothing to do with sensation. And its properties stand out the more closely we scrutinise it. 317 is a prime, not because we think so, or because our mind is a shape in one way rather than another, but because it is so. Because mathematical reality is built in that way. But obviously you can know I like, don't go along with this as a philosophy, but I'm not really that bothered about arguing against it in this talk. What I'm interested in is, is, is seeing this as a story we tell about maths, a really powerful story. Of maths as, in some way, putting us in communication with something outside of normal reality. And you can see that massively in popular culture, the idea of maths as um, the, the gateway to the absolute. Um, there's a lot of things about <coughs> spirituality. If you know the Da Vinci Code, the, um, uh, the code broken in that, Sophie Mavert, is actually the descent, direct descendant of Jesus and Mary Magdalene. It's not usually that unsubtle of spirituality, <laughs> um, but there, there it is. The, one of the most interesting is Pi, which is, um, uh, I think, the first feature film directed by Darren Aronofsky. Yeah. Oh, who's, um, I think he, he didn't know it, didn't he? Oh, so yeah. it's, he's all over the buses at the moment. Um, and it's, it's a story of Max Cohen, who's looking, this is Max Cohen here and here, he's looking for numbers in pi, so this is what he's messing around with. Um, he's going a little bit crazy, because that's what mathematicians do in films. Um, and he's pursued by two people. One person is someone who's banker, and she thinks, she's pursuing it, and she thinks that within the, the number pattern of pi is the secret of predicting the stock market. The other person who's pursuing him is this guy. He's, um, in the Jewish Kabbalistic sect. So he thinks that in the decimal expansion, Pi is the secret name for God, and that if you can find it, that will bring the Messiah uh, and heaven on earth. So again, you've got this link to spirituality that's very, very strong in that film, um, and linked to kind of special powers. You know, if any of you have seen the code.org um, video, Will I Am calls um, coding, which is kind of like maths in a lot of ways, the way it's being signified, um, the nearest thing we have to a superpower. Also, that's the, um, I haven't seen the movie, but is the denouement that actually anything you want is encoded in the digits of pi if you go far enough? No. No. no the denouement is great. I'll, come, I'll tell you the denouement in a little bit, okay? Because I have, this is actually taken from a chapter that I've written from the, for the Princeton Companion to Apply the Maths, um, which should be out, I think, in about a year. So I can send you the written version which has more in it, and I have got that in, so I'll include that this time, since you've asked about it. Um, the other example is, which I like is um, Ian Malcolm in the book and film versions of Jurassic Park. His power, his mathematical knowledge, which he calls it, um, himself being a chaotician, gives him a phenomenal predictive powers. He knows everything that is going to happen in that dinosaur park over the course of the weekend. To the minutest detail, even knowing that the all-female dinosaurs are going to sexually reproduce. He knows that because he knows maths. It is the closest thing we have to a superpower. I think, well, I am, it's correct. Um, and he won the voice, didn't they? So, um, going on to these people. So this idea of maths, these people are special because they kind of get these special powers from the access to mathematics. But the specialness plays out in lots of ways. So not just in actual spiritual way, the superpower way, it also plays out in the genius way, it also plays out in the mad way. So the kind of idea that it's inside you, the maths, and it plays out through mental health problems, whether it's an enigma or a beautiful mind or um, pi. So how does pi end? He gets increasingly close to a nervous breakdown. In a fantasy sequence, he um, drills into his own head to excise, presumably to excise the mathematics, 
from it. And the next day he wakes up. He can't do maths anymore, but he's happy. That's the end, really. Okay. So I don't know whether you call that happy ending. It's very dramatic. And I've shown it in the past, and some people have never forgotten it. So I haven't shown it today. Um, there is an idea in all these films of maths colonising the personality. That is all you are, is maths. Um, perhaps the most, a quite extreme example, but not atypical, it's fairly typical, comes from Kate Atkinson's novel, Case Histories. There's a married paedophile mathematician in the novel, and she says of him, he didn't really feel the need for the person of his life. In fact, he found the concept of sharing life bizarre. He had maths which filled up his time almost completely, so he wasn't entirely sure what he wanted with life. Women seem to him to be in possession of all kinds of undesirable properties, <laughs> chiefly madness, that's ironic, um, but also a multiplicity of physical drawbacks, blood, sex, children, which runs sexually and armor. So, um, you can see here the construction of women as other to the character of the mathematician. That doesn't just come from this book, it comes all the way through. We're going to come on to that in a moment. Though I have to put some pictures of Ian Malcolm in, because he's. Um, that's uh, Jeff Goldblum in Jurassic Park. But I want to just look a slight detour into geeks, because I think geeks is another way in which, within popular culture, we have that specialness of maths inscribed onto the body. Um, do people know there's a great urban dictionary online? It's very good for pop culture definitions. This is um, one of the definitions of geek on there. The people you pick on in high school and wind up working for as an adult. It captures the combination of awe and derision that there is in the um, cultural gaze of the geek. This is probably epitomised, this mix of awe and derision, in the phenomenon of geek chic. So geek chic, going to the other diction again, I've got two definitions. An obvious oxymoron. <coughs> geek chic emerges from oxygen deprived hallucination in which geeks evolve into actual existence as a sort of technocracy radiating the holy aura of cool. You'll find no more crushing arguments against geek chic than Bill Gates, who despite being the richest man in the world, supports an apparent five dollar coffee and birth control glasses. Another more flattering definition of clothing or accessories that are very geeky nerds, and yet at the same time says, I'm cool because I'm proud of the fact that I'm a nerd and I'm not afraid to dress the part. So that's unflattering, that's flattering, that geek chic. Um, but in both cases, this is about people being distinctive, different, standing up against um, opposition or facing opposition. In all cases, it's about geeks being different. It's not about people being normal if they're involved in technocracy, the maths, the technology and stuff. There's no sense in which you're kind of an amateur technologist. You are, it's taking over your whole life again. It defines you. You are a geek. Um, of course, I, sh uh, shall I show this? How much time have I got left? Oh, uh, well, um, you've got half an hour in total including in discussion. Okay. So. Um, I won't show a clip from, um, um, what's it called? Big Bang Theory. But if you, you know, it's that's why I could have shown, to show that kind of opposition, the way that the geekiness is captured in that. But I'll go straight on and I'll talk more about um, gender. Gender comes up in the Big Bang Theory very strongly, as I said at the beginning of that clip, with the, the blonde who's wearing pink, who's on the phone, compared to the very geeky boys who are um, in front of their computers. So I want to talk about gender. I want to do it using a slightly longer clip from A Beautiful Mind. This is the bit of Beautiful Mind where he do does some maths or talks about some maths rather than just, he does a lot of that, doesn't he, on Beautiful Mind? That's how people do maths on TV. They, they scribble on usually transparent boards, sometimes windows, sometimes mirrors. Um, this is the bit in the bar, if you've seen the film. So have a think about this as you watch it. Have a think about it in relation to numbers, have a think about it in relation to gender. Father of modern economics. And, uh, 
competition. Individual ambition serves the common good. Exactly. Every man for himself, gentlemen. Yeah, and those who strike out are stuck with their friends. I'm not going to strike out. You can lead a blonde water, but you can't even drink. I don't think he's a bad Alright, let me move. She looked over there. She's looking at Ash. Alright, he may have the upper hand now. We'll wait until they open his mouth. <laughs> <laughs> So they, they use historical bases don't control what happens. They let people no, make no, no, but I'm just, I mean, if you yeah. Do, yeah, okay, so I'm, But I have no well, idea. Yeah, yeah. But it, I suppose it's interesting that if you look at the, um, the social network, the inspiration for the, the creation of Facebook is also a woman. It's often, it's a, it's a common narrative that flows that red men need um, the inspiration of a beautiful, in this case, classically beautiful woman. She's blonde and she's tall. And who's unnamed? She is, in the credit, she's called the blonde. <laughs> <laughs> and she doesn't yes. speak. Well, then she's lucky to get a credit. I'll say that. She's a better agent, Yeah. Oh, yes. <laughs> One interesting aspect of that clip is that they're using really high level stuff for very base, or base motives, and so there's a kind of irony, it's yeah. almost like, a, yeah. I mean, I think it's a self-conscious joke in a way, yeah. 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 but it's a very well, sexist joke. It's interesting, because it's kind of the same um, lavish sense of humour, which in a very different way operates in the Dave show, um, uh, Del Rebrand's School of Hard Songs, it's like using this high power mass for very silly problems, often with a kind of lavish kind of thing going on, yeah. 
there is the, a big different view of this uh, on this in the in the play proof and in the right. corresponding film. Yeah. So there is a, a bit different view on on, 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 the, on the gender aspect in, in, in mathematics. So, yeah. so where there is obviously the ability there, but there is a suppression from society uh, to, to, to to show this uh, to show this ability. So that's, that's or, or or from whatever. Yeah, but yeah. there is clear devotion and, and ability, of course, of the daughter of this. Yeah, I mean, proof is very interesting. What's interesting often, that it doesn't just apply to mathematicians, female mathematicians, also female scientists, is the idea that ability has to be inherited for women. Naturally, we don't see Nash's parents, there's no sense of inheritance. And proof is all about she gets her maths from her father. The father has to be there. Um, it has to be from an older, more senior man. Uh, that's the kind of recurring thing that happens with Jodie Foster in contact, it happens repeatedly. Which well, is not so wrong historically. It's not about things historically, it's about what narratives play. These narratives get repeated over and over again in truthful in stories which are based on fact and stories which aren't based on fact. They're about what stories play in Hollywood narratives. I don't, I don't, I don't think there are, we can ever say, oh, that was true, that's why that happened. Because we can look at all the other things which were true, like Turing being gay, which was, is not an enigma, for, is a classic example. Like his bisexuality. We don't, Nash was, you know, shagging blokes a lot. Do we get any mention of that? No. Uh, the ratio of, of, sex, of queer sexualities in these films, even when they're factual, these are factual and important parts of their um, arguments, is shocking. How about the next thing? Let's go. Okay, one more comment. Yeah. Just, just a comment to, on, the, on the question of, of historicity here. I think what can be taken as historical from, from the clip from A Beautiful Mind um, is, is the representation of gender relations in the madman era among graduates. And the reason that that is used in that way is to be able to, to, be able to display this particular attitude to an audience from the 1990s uh, 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 so that you've got this kind of conservation of the image of the mathematician. Uh, it's, just, it's a convenience that allows your, 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 your representation of this particular kind of geekiness. Okay, that's an interesting point. If you compare it with Mad Men, though, which is also representing the same era, the same relationships, you get incredibly, you get the view from the women. You see the sexual yes, harassment sure. because you, these are well-rounded female characters whose emotions you feel who are points of identification for you. They're not anonymous blondes who don't get to talk. It's a radically different representation. There's a massive difference between film and TV. I think in terms of how women characters are portrayed, how much spaces are. Is it very quick? Uh, it's actually really uh, going away from uh, mathematics in this discussion because this is a not mathematical issue. Okay. It is a general issue. I don't want to a single American film. I cannot quickly name a film which shows as a central character a very clever woman. And for some reason, clever woman appear only in uh, Scandinavian no. uh, crime drama. No, that's not true. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know that clever women? There's a, a very clever woman called Michelle Paul in Oxford Brookes University, Paul is P-A-U-L-E, who did a fabulous PhD about smart girls. There are loads of smart girls on TV. I should have worn my Villa Kamar's t-shirt. She is a smart girl. Buffy and Willow, there's loads on TV. Katie Heron, there's a whole generation of smart girls and smart women. Well, smart I'm emerging, but, but let, let's save it for the question. So I want smart to and arguments. intellectually powerful, different things. Oh, I think Willow is smart and intellectually powerful in, in Buffy. Buffy I think it, is very smart and very clever. Yeah. But Buffy never spent ten days in a row without sleeping, solving a single problem. Okay, that's. I think Willow, Willow Rosenberg probably did. But that's, that's a, a long sorry, detour into Buffyology, which we're not going to do. So, okay, Willow. Right, uh, uh, things to say about that clip which haven't already been said. Isn't it interesting that. Um, the math bit in that film is very similar to the math bits in numbers. You have to come outside the normal action, you have a different voiceover. Suddenly the geekiness in, in um, the John Nash voice, played by Russell Crowe, disappears. He has this very smooth voiceover during that, the, the math bit. You have the, the gentle music, you have people moving around, the blonde moves magically. It's all choreographed to the tune of mathematics. Again, you come out of the everyday in order to render the everyday mathematical, then you go back into the everyday. So that's a similar pattern that we're going to... What was the? I, I'm trying to remember now. Yeah. Because there's in connection with Tom's point, there's 
music that we can now recognize as of that period yes. playing. And I was thinking that, and part of the point we have to have the, the 40s jazz on yeah. all the time to be reminded. But not during the math bit. You go into a different form of music during the math bit. Is it, is it, does it? Yes. Yeah? yeah and, and the jazzy kind of 50s music picks up again at the end. Right. So yeah, it's the same pattern as, as happens in numbers. Um, in terms of the woman, just a quick comparison with the earlier Mean Girls clip. In the Mean Girls clip, you've got a boy, and you've got Ken Herod's relationship to Aaron Summers. First difference is that he's a pot name, he's got personality, which we don't have in the, in the Beautiful Mind clip. Also, what's interesting is the relationship to um, the central character's um, mathematical ability. In the Mean Girls clip, you remember what happens is she has to see past Aaron Summers to the board. He actually has to metaphorically and literally get past him. He's an obstacle to maths. It's the complete opposite of the beautiful mind. She is what enables him to do maths. She is what inspires him. She is not an obstacle for him. So even the gender relations are very different, the way that men figure in women's narratives. And the way that women figure in men's narratives. I think there's something of that going in proof as well. Women, so women mathematicians, as I said, you have got Anita Ramanujan. Um, but her name, Ramanujan, it suggests that she has an inheritance again from a male mathematician. She is his doctoral student and his girlfriend. I mean, again, the relationships of dependence on a male mathematician are hor horrendous, aren't they? they? They recur all the way through. Um, even in Beautiful Mind, Alicia Nash is his student initially, and then his wife. Um, this Mildred Finch, they did get criticism. That's one thing about TV, it goes on, they get criticism, they sometimes respond. They introduce a senior woman, Mildred Finch. She doesn't do so much math, she's basically an administrator. She becomes a love interest for Charlie and Don's dad. So again, love interest for a more central man character. She disappears after nine episodes. Out of 118 episodes, she's in nine. She disappears, no one even comments on her going. In spite of the fact that she's their boss. Um, <laughs> So that's gender. A little bit about social class. The best film to think about social class in maths is Goodwill Hunting. Um, we've got Matt Damon there as the unself-taught, brilliant mathematician um, who is working as a janitor at MIT and becomes discovered. Um, and he starts to learn maths. And what, what's interesting is if you, right early on in the film, you have him, he's been abused as a child um, and taken into care. And you see him seeing the person who abused him as a child and attacking him really violently, really aggressively. Um, and what you get there is, is a kind of typical working class response to violence. It's very different than the way in which someone like Charlie, who's more middle class, deals with pain. Um, but that happens early in the film. What you can see during the film is a process of becoming middle class through becoming involved with, um, in the maths team at MIT and through a process of counselling with Robin Williams. Um, so I'll just postpone this and then tell you what happens to him. Right, so this process of counselling, so you can see it as a kind of process of becoming middle class. He also goes out with a very upper middle class woman at Harvard, so you can see this whole trajectory that's represented spatially in the film as well. Um, and so it's happened recently, hasn't it? The government um, advisor in this country has said that the solution to um, poor attainment and low aspirations is for working class people to become more middle class. So you can see that kind of normalisation of that narrative through this film. The sort of problematic idea that that's what we need to do to solve the problems. And not looking at deprivation, not looking at poverty, not looking at the way the educational system is prejudiced, but looking at that as the kind of root. So in the same way that women are supposed to fix the male model, um, the working class people are supposed to fix this middle class model. Okay, what I want to do now is to just give you very briefly, um, to end, some stories about people who can't do maths. We don't often talk about those. There are lots and lots of stories in popular culture about people who can't do maths. Um, I'd love to show you this clip, but unfortunately, uh, Fox are amazingly good at policing YouTube and take off any episodes of Simpsons. But there's a great bit of Simpsons where um, Bart is um, doing a test and the first question says, it's a, it's a context question, and a train starts, leaves the station here, and then these people get on, and these people get on, and he gets this whole set of images in his head, and he sees himself initially sitting in the carriage, then he sees all these people walking around, and then he starts getting thumped by the conductor, and the he hasn't even got to the end of that first question, he's just got completely captured by his narrative, and the end of the test is up. 
And there's lots of this, people thrown by maths questions in classrooms, in schools. And we need to think about that in the context of the way that maths is um, inscribed into our national and individual policy texts. This is um, from, oh, what's that report called? Sorry, a big report about maths. A big like report? No, it's um, Making Maths Count, Adrian Smith. He puts it very well, but you can find this everywhere. It has been widely recognised that maths occupies a rather special position. It's a major intellectual discipline in its own right, as well as providing the underpinning language for the rest of science and engineering, and increasingly for other disciplines in the social and medical sciences. It underpins major sectors of modern business and industry, in particular financial services and ICT. It also provides the individual citizen with empowering skills for the conduct of private and social life, with key skills required at virtually all levels of employment. What you can see in texts like this is the stitching together of national and individual aspirations and ideas about what it is to be successful. National and individual ideas of progress. You are progressing individually if you learn maths, we will progress as a nation if we, people learn maths. Um, I, I, again, I don't want to talk about whether these are true or not. I want to just say that what this does is place a certain responsibility on the citizen and a certain feeling of failure when they do not experience success in mathematics. So it amplifies that failure and personalises that failure. I want to end with two adverts. These are adverts that come from campaigns which happened over the last 10 years or so for adult numeracy in this country. Um, so you may remember a couple of them. Um, they're just like these 30 second commercials. The first one is the Gremlins campaign. <coughs> I want you to think about who is being inscribed as not able to do maths and as therefore as an individual and national failure.
our audience pre-access the people who walk in in front of us from a teacher, pre-access the people who walk into schools, and how that shapes who can and cannot do maths.